How can Lemuel Gulliver escape from the Lilliputians? They're only six inches tall. Should be a cinch, right? Jonathan Swift, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. The vintage episode for the week is The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Be sure to check it out on Tuesday. If you enjoy the show, please become a monthly supporter and help us continue to highlight these amazing stories. Please go to classictalesaudiobooks.com and become a monthly supporter for as little as $5 a month. As a thank you gesture, we'll send you a coupon code every month for $8 off any audiobook order. Give more and you get more. It's a great way to help us keep producing sparkling audiobook content. Go to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com and become a supporter today. I've been having fun designing the specials for our Kickstarter for the next Arzen Lupin book, The Golden Triangle. Things are moving along nicely. Keep an ear open for when we pull the trigger, hopefully in a couple of weeks. And it's time for the Classic Tales Book Club to meet again. Keep an eye on your inboxes on Tuesday for our monthly newsletter, which will contain the Zoom link. Our Zoom meeting will be on Wednesday, April 10th at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll talk about the satirical nature of Gulliver's travels and the power of satire. See you then. Follow the link in the show notes to subscribe to our newsletter and get the Zoom link on Tuesday. Mark Twain is quoted as saying that a classic is a book which people praise and don't read. Gulliver's Travels likely fits into this category for a lot of us. Maybe we've seen the Max Fleischer cartoon, or the Ray Harryhausen film in the 70s, or the film with Jack Black in 2010. But we've probably never read it, or we tried and gave it up. So what is the lasting appeal of this difficult book? Gulliver's Travels was originally published in 1727. Put simply, it's a satire of British monarchy and imperialism. Swift succeeds in taking the mundane, or something we largely take for granted, and pushing it to the extreme to show its absurdity. This goes for everything, from governments to our own physical bodies. Oh yeah, nothing is safe so get ready for some bodily functions we'd rather not talk about to come front and center. Gulliver records his travels to several different lands of adventure. Instead of going through the entire book now, we'll tackle them one voyage at a time. This first stint will be the first part of the book, a voyage to Lilliput in three parts. Gulliver travels to the land of Lilliput as well as the land of giants and also visits the dystopian world of the Huinims, among others. It can be kind of hard to get through at times, but I mean, for being written in 1727, it's pretty groundbreaking. I hope you like it. And now, A Voyage to Lilliput, Part 1 of 3, from Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. The Publisher to the Reader the author of these travels, Mr. Lemuel Gulliver, is my ancient and intimate friend. There's likewise some relation between us on the mother's side. About three years ago, Mr. Gulliver, growing weary of the concourse of curious people coming to him at his house in Redriff, made a small purchase of land with a convenient house near Newark in Nottinghamshire, his native country, where he now lives retired yet in good esteem among his neighbors. Although Mr. Gulliver was born in Nottinghamshire, where his father dwelt, yet I have heard him say his family came from Oxfordshire, to confirm which I have observed in the churchyard at Banbury in that county several tombs and monuments of the Gullivers. Eh, before he quitted Redriff, he left the custody of the following papers in my hands, with the liberty to dispose of them as I should think fit. I have carefully perused them three times. The style is very plain and simple. 
and the only fault I find is that the author, after the manner of travelers, is a little too circumstantial. There is an air of truth apparent through the whole, and indeed the author was so distinguished for his veracity that it became a sort of proverb among his neighbors at Redriff, when anyone affirmed a thing to say it was as true as if Mr. Gulliver had spoken it. By the advice of several worthy persons to whom, with the author's permission, I communicated these papers, I now venture to send them into the world, hoping they may be, at least for some time, a better entertainment to our young noblemen than the common scribbles of politics and party. This volume would have been at least twice as large if I had not made bold to strike out innumerable passages relating to the winds and tides, as well as to the variations and bearings in the several voyages, together with the minute descriptions of the management of the ship in storms and the style of sailors. Likewise, the account of longitudes and latitudes, wherein I have reason to apprehend that Mr. Gulliver may be a little dissatisfied. But I was resolved to fit the work as much as possible to the general capacity of readers. However, if my own ignorance in sea affairs shall have led me to commit some mistakes, I alone am answerable for them. And if any traveller hath a curiosity to see the whole work at large, as it came from the hands of the author, I will be ready to gratify him. As for any further particulars relating to the author, the reader will receive satisfaction from the first pages of the book. Richard Simpson A letter from Captain Gulliver to his cousin Simpson, written in the year 1727. I hope you will be ready to own publicly, whenever you shall be called to it, that by your great and frequent urgency you prevailed on me to publish a very loose and uncorrect account of my travels, with directions to hire some young gentleman of either university to put them in order and correct the style, as my cousin Dampier did, by my advice in his book called A Voyage Round the World. But I do not remember I gave you power to consent that anything should be omitted, as much less that anything should be inserted. Therefore, as to the latter, I do here renounce everything of that kind, particularly a paragraph about Her Majesty Queen Anne, of most pious and glorious memory although I did reverence and esteem her more than any of human species. But you, or your interpolator, ought to have considered that it was not my inclination. So was it not decent to praise any animal of our composition before my master who in him? And besides, the fact was altogether false. For to my knowledge, being in England during some part of Her Majesty's reign, she did govern by a chief minister nay, even by two successively. The first whereof was the Lord of Godolphin, and the second the Lord of Oxford. So that you have made me say the thing that was not. Likewise, in the account of the Academy of Projectors, and several passages of my discourse to my master who in him, you have either omitted some material circumstances, or minced and changed them in such a manner that I do hardly know my own work. When I formally hinted to you something of this in a letter, you were pleased to answer that you were afraid of giving offence, that people in power were very watchful over the press, and apt not only to interpret, but to punish everything which looked like an innuendo, as I think you call it. But pray, how could that which I spoke so many years ago, and at about five thousand leagues distance in another reign, be applied to any of the yahoos, who are now said to govern the herd, especially at a time when I little thought, or feared, the unhappiness of living under them. Have I not the most reason to complain, when I see these very yahoos carried by huinims in a vehicle, as if they were brutes, and those the rational creatures? And indeed to avoid so monstrous and detestable a sight was one principal motive of my retirement hither. Thus much I thought proper to tell you, in relation to yourself, and to the trust I reposed in you. 
I do in the next place complain of my own great want of judgment in being prevailed upon by the entreaties and false reasoning of you and some others, very much against my own opinion, to suffer my travels to be published. Pray bring to your mind how often I desired you to consider, when you insisted on the motive of public good, that the yahoos were a species of animals utterly incapable of amendment by precept or example. And so it is proved. For instead of seeing a full stop put to all abuses and corruptions, at least on this little island, as I had reason to expect, behold, after above six months' warning, I cannot learn that my book has produced one single effect according to my intentions. I desired you would let me know by a letter when party and faction were extinguished, judges learned and upright, pleaders honest and modest, with some tincture of common sense, and Smithfield blazing with pyramids of law books. The young nobility's education entirely changed, the physicians banished, the female yahoos abounding in virtue, honor, truth, and good sense, courts and levies of great ministers thoroughly weeded and swept, wit, merit, and learning rewarded, all disgracers of the press in prose and verse condemned to eat nothing but their own cotton and quench their thirst with their own ink. These, and a thousand other reformations, I firmly counted upon by your encouragement, as indeed they were plainly deducible from the precepts delivered in my book. And it must be owned that seven months were a sufficient time to correct every vice and folly to which yahoos are subject, if their natures had been capable of the least disposition to virtue or wisdom. Yet, so far have you been from answering my expectation in any of your letters, that on the contrary, you are loading our carrier every week with libels, and keys, and reflections, and memoirs, and second parts, wherein I see myself accused of reflecting upon great state folk, of degrading human nature, for so they have still the confidence to style it, and of abusing the female sex. I find likewise that the writers of those bundles are not agreed among themselves, for some of them will not allow me to be the author of my own travels, and others make me author of books to which I am wholly a stranger. I find likewise that your printer has been so careless as to confound the times and mistake the dates of my several voyages and returns, neither assigning the true year, nor the true month, nor the day of the month. And I hear the original manuscript is all destroyed since the publication of my book, Neither have I a copy left. However, I sent you some corrections, which you may insert, if ever there should be a second edition, and yet I cannot stand to them, but shall leave that matter to my judicious and candid readers to adjust it as they please. I hear some of our sea yahoos find fault with my sea language, as not proper in many parts, nor now in use. I cannot help it, in my first voyages, when I was young, I was instructed by the oldest mariners and learned to speak as they did. But I have since found that the sea yahoos are apt, like the land ones, to become newfangled in their words, which the latter change every year, insomuch as I remember upon each return to my own country, their old dialect was so altered that I could hardly understand the new. And I observe... When any yahoo comes from London out of curiosity to visit me at my house, we neither of us are able to deliver our conceptions in a manner intelligible to the other. If the censure of the yahoos should any way affect me, I should have great reason to complain that some of them are so bold as to think my book of travels a mere fiction out of my own brain, and have gone so far as to drop hints that the huinams and yahoos have no more existence than the inhabitants of Utopia. Indeed, I must confess that as to the people of Lilliput, Brobdingnag, for so the word should have been spelt, and not erroneously Brobdingnag, and Laputa, I have never yet heard of any Yahoo so presumptuous as to dispute their being, or the facts I have related concerning them, because the truth immediately strikes every reader with conviction. And is there less probability in my account of the Huinams or Yahoos when it is manifest as to the latter? There are so many thousands, even in this country, who only differ from their brother brutes in Huinam land 
because they use a sort of jabber and do not go naked. I wrote for their amendment and not their approbation. The united praise of the whole race would be of less consequence to me than the neighing of those two degenerate whoinums I keep in my stable, because from these, degenerate as they are, I still improve in some virtues without any mixture of vice. Do these miserable animals presume to think that I am so degenerated as to defend my veracity? Yahoo as I am, it is well known through all who in him land that by the instructions and example of my illustrious master, I was able, in the compass of two years, although I confess with the utmost difficulty, to remove that infernal habit of lying, shuffling, deceiving, and equivocating, so deeply rooted in the very souls of all my species, especially the Europeans. I have other complaints to make upon this vexatious occasion, but I forbear troubling myself or you any further. I must freely confess that since my last return, some corruptions of my Yahoo nature have revived in me by conversing with a few of your species, and particularly those of my own family, by an unavoidable necessity. Else I should never have attempted so absurd a project as that of reforming the Yahoo race in this kingdom. But I have now done with all such visionary schemes forever. April 2nd, 1727 Part 1. A Voyage to Lilliput Chapter 1. The author gives some account of himself and family. His first inducements to travel. He is shipwrecked and swims for his life, gets safe on shore in the country of Lilliput, is made a prisoner and carried up the country. My father had a small estate in Nottinghamshire. I was the third of five sons. He sent me to Emmanuel College in Cambridge at fourteen years old, where I resided three years and applied myself close to my studies. But the charge of maintaining me, although I had a very scanty allowance, being too great for a narrow fortune, I was bound apprentice to Mr. James Bates, an eminent surgeon in London, with whom I continued four years. My father now and then sending me small sums of money, I laid them out in learning navigation and other parts of the mathematics, useful to those who intend to travel, as I always believed it would be, some time or other, my fortune to do so. When I left Mr. Bates, I went down to my father, where, by the assistance of him and my Uncle John and some other relations, I got forty pounds, and a promise of thirty pounds a year to maintain me at Leiden. There I studied physic two years and seven months, knowing it would be useful in long voyages. Soon after my return from Leiden, I was recommended by my good master, Mr. Bates, to be surgeon to the Swallow, Captain Abraham Pannell, commander, with whom I continued three years and a half, making a voyage or two into the Levant and some other parts. When I came back, I resolved to settle in London, to which Mr. Bates, my master, encouraged me, and by him I was recommended to several patients. I took part of a small house in the old Jewry, and being advised to alter my condition, I married Mrs. Mary Burton, second daughter to Mr. Edmund Burton, hosier, in Newgate Street, with whom I received four hundred pounds for a portion. But my good master Bates, dying in two years after, and I, having few friends, my business began to fail, for my conscience would not suffer me to imitate the bad practice of too many among my brethren. Having therefore consulted with my wife and some of my acquaintance, I determined to go again to sea. I was surgeon successively in two ships, and made several voyages for six years to the East and West Indies, by which I got some addition to my fortune. My hours of leisure I spent in reading the best authors, ancient and modern being always provided with a good number of books, and when I was ashore, in observing the manners and dispositions of the people, as well as learning their language, wherein I had a great facility by the strength of my memory. The last of these voyages, not proving very fortunate, I grew weary of the sea, 
and intended to stay at home with my wife and family. I have removed from the old Jewry to Fetter Lane, and from thence to Wapping, hoping to get business among the sailors. But it would not turn to account. After three years' expectation that things would mend, I accepted an advantageous offer from Captain William Pritchard, master of the Antelope, who was making a voyage to the South Sea. We set sail from Bristol, May 4th, 1699, and our voyage was at first very prosperous. It would not be proper, for some reasons, to trouble the reader with the particulars of our adventures in those seas. Let it suffice to inform him that in our passage from thence to the East Indies, we were driven by a violent storm to the northwest of Van Diemen's Land. By an observation, we found ourselves in the latitude of thirty degrees two minutes south. Twelve of our crew were dead by immoderate labor and ill food. The rest were in a very weak condition. On the 5th of November, which was the beginning of summer in those parts, the weather being very hazy, the seamen spied a rock within half a cable's length of the ship, but the wind was so strong that we were driven directly upon it, and immediately split. Six of the crew, of whom I was one, having let down the boat into the sea, made a shift to get clear of the ship and the rock. We rowed, by my computation, about three leagues, till we were able to work no longer, being already spent with labor while we were in the ship. We therefore trusted ourselves to the mercy of the waves, and in about half an hour the boat was overset by a sudden flurry from the north. What became of my companions in the boat, as well as of those who escaped on the rock, or were left on the vessel, I cannot tell. I conclude they were all lost. For my own part, I swam as fortune directed me, and was pushed forward by wind and tide. I often let my legs drop and could feel no bottom. But when I was almost gone, and able to struggle no longer, I found myself within my depth, and by this time the storm was much abated. The declivity was so small that I walked near a mile before I got to the shore, which I conjectured was about eight o'clock in the evening. I then advanced forward near half a mile, but could not discover any sign of houses or inhabitants. At least I was in so weak a condition that I did not observe them. I was extremely tired, and with that, and the heat of the weather, and about half a pint of brandy that I drank as I left the ship, I found myself much inclined to sleep. I lay down on the grass, which was very short and soft, where I slept sounder than ever I remember to have done in my life, and, as I reckoned, about nine hours. For when I awakened, it was just daylight. I attempted to rise, but was not able to stir. For as I happened to lie on my back, I found my arms and legs were strongly fastened on each side to the ground, and my hair, which was long and thick, tied down in the same manner. I likewise felt several slender ligatures across my body, from my armpits to my thighs. I could only look upwards. The sun began to grow hot and the light offended my eyes. I heard a confused noise about me, but in the posture I lay, could see nothing except the sky. In little time I felt something alive moving on my left leg, which, advancing gently forward over my breast, came almost up to my chin, when, bending my eyes downwards as much as I could, I perceived it to be a human creature not six inches high with a bow and arrow in his hands, and a quiver at his back. In the meantime, I felt at least forty more of the same kind, as I conjectured, following the first. I was in the utmost astonishment, and roared so loud that they all ran back in a fright, and some of them, as I was afterwards told, were hurt with the falls they got leaping from my sides upon the ground. However, they soon returned, and one of them, who ventured so far as to get a full sight of my face, lifting up his hands and eyes by way of admiration, cried out in a shrill but distinct voice, Hekinadigle! The others repeated the same words several times, but then I knew not what they meant. I lay all this while, as the reader may believe, in great uneasiness. At length, struggling to get loose, 
I had the fortune to break the strings and wrench out the pegs that fastened my left arm to the ground. For by lifting it up to my face, I discovered the methods they had taken to bind me. And at the same time with a violent pull, which gave me excessive pain, I a little loosened the strings that tied down my hair on the left side, so that I was able to turn my head about two inches. But the creatures ran off a second time before I could seize them. Whereupon there was a great shout, in a very shrill accent, and after it ceased I heard one of them cry aloud, Tolgofornak! when in an instant I felt above a hundred arrows discharged on my left hand, which pricked me like so many needles. And besides they shot another flight into the air, as we do bombs in Europe, whereof many, I suppose, fell on my body, though I felt them not, and some on my face, which I immediately covered with my left hand. When this shower of arrows was over, I fell a-groaning with grief and pain, and then striving again to get loose, they discharged another volley, larger than the first, and some of them attempted with spears to stick me in the sides. But by good luck, I had on a buff jerkin, which they could not pierce. I thought it the most prudent method to lie still, and my design was to continue so till night, when, my left hand being already loose, I could easily free myself. And as for the inhabitants, I had reason to believe I might be a match for the greatest army they could bring against me if they were all of the same size with him that I saw. But fortune disposed otherwise of me. When the people observed I was quiet, they discharged no more arrows. But by the noise I heard, I knew their numbers increased. And about four yards from me, over against my right ear, I heard a knocking for above an hour, like that of people at work. When turning my head that way, as well as the pegs and strings would permit me, I saw a stage erected about a foot and a half from the ground, capable of holding four of the inhabitants, with two or three ladders to mount it, from whence one of them, who seemed to be a person of quality, made me a long speech, whereof I understood not one syllable. But I should have mentioned that before the principal person began his oration, he cried out three times, Langro de Hulsan! These words and the former were afterwards repeated and explained to me. Whereupon immediately about fifty of the inhabitants came and cut the strings that fastened the left side of my head, which gave me the liberty of turning it to the right, and of observing the person and gesture of him that was to speak. He appeared to be of a middle age, and taller than any of the other three who attended him, whereof one was a page that held up his train, and seemed to be somewhat longer than my middle finger. The other two stood one on each side to support him. He acted every part of an orator, and I could observe many periods of threatenings and others of promises, pity, and kindness. I answered in a few words, but in the most submissive manner, lifting up my left hand, and both my eyes to the sun, as calling him for a witness, and being almost famished with hunger, having not eaten a morsel for some hours before I left the ship. I found the demands of nature so strong upon me that I could not forbear showing my impatience, perhaps against the strict rules of decency, by putting my finger frequently to my mouth to signify that I wanted food. The Hurgo, for so they call a great lord, as I afterwards learnt, understood me very well. He descended from the stage and commanded that several ladders should be applied to my sides on which above a hundred of the inhabitants mounted and walked towards my mouth, laden with baskets full of meat, which had been provided and sent thither by the king's orders, upon the first intelligence he received of me. I observed there was the flesh of several animals, but could not distinguish them by taste. There were shoulders, legs, and loins, shaped like those of mutton, and very well dressed, but smaller than the wings of a lark. I ate them two or three at a mouthful, and took three loaves at a time, about the bigness of musket bullets. They supplied me as fast as they could, showing a thousand marks of wonder and astonishment at my bulk and appetite. I then made another sign that I wanted drink. They found by my eating that a small quantity would not suffice me, and being a most ingenious people, they slung up with great dexterity one of their largest hogsheads then rolled it towards my hand, and beat out the top. I drank it off at a draught, 
which I might well do, for it did not hold half a pint, and tasted like a small wine of burgundy, but much more delicious. They brought me a second hog's head, which I drank in the same manner, and made signs for more, but they had none to give me. When I had performed these wonders, they shouted for joy and danced upon my breast, repeating several times as they did at first, Hekina Deagle. They made me a sign that I should throw down the two hogsheads, but first warning the people below to stand out of the way, crying aloud, Borak Mavola! And when they saw the vessels in the air, there was a universal shout of Hekina Deagle. I confess I was often tempted, while they were passing backwards and forwards on my body, to seize forty or fifty of the first that came in my reach and dash them against the ground. But the remembrance of what I had felt, which probably might not be the worst they could do, and the promise of honor I made them, for so I interpreted by submissive behavior, soon drove out these imaginations. Besides, I now considered myself as bound by the laws of hospitality to a people who had treated me with so much expense and magnificence. However, in my thoughts I could not sufficiently wonder at the intrepidity of these diminutive mortals, who durst venture to mount and walk upon my body while one of my hands was at liberty, without trembling at the very sight of so prodigious a creature as I must appear to them. After some time, when they observed that I made no more demands for meat, there appeared before me a person of high rank from His Imperial Majesty. His Excellency, having mounted on the small of my right leg, advanced forwards up to my face, with about a dozen of his retinue, and producing his credentials under the signet royal, which he applied close to my eyes, spoke about ten minutes without any signs of anger, but with a kind of determinate resolution, often pointing forwards, which, as I afterwards found, was towards the capital city, about half a mile distant, whither it was agreed by His Majesty in Council, that I must be conveyed. I answered in few words, but to no purpose, and made a sign with my hand that was loose, putting it to the other, but over His Excellency's head for fear of hurting him or his train, and then to my own head and body, to signify that I desired my liberty. It appeared that he understood me well enough, for he shook his head by way of disapprobation, and held his hand in a posture to show that I must be carried as a prisoner. However, he made other signs to let me understand that I should have meat and drink enough, and very good treatment. Whereupon I once more thought of attempting to break my bonds. But again, when I felt the smart of their arrows upon my face and hands, which were all in blisters, and many of the darts still sticking in them, and observing likewise that the number of my enemies increased, I gave tokens to let them know that they might do with me what they pleased. Upon this the Hurgo and his train withdrew, with much civility and cheerful countenances. Soon after I heard a general shout with frequent repetitions of the words Peplom Selan, and I felt great numbers of people on my left side relaxing the cords to such a degree that I was able to turn upon my right and to ease myself with making water which I very plentifully did, to the great astonishment of the people, who, conjecturing by my motion what I was going to do, immediately opened to the right and left on that side, to avoid the torrent, which fell with such noise and violence from me. But before this they had daubed my face and both my hands with a sort of ointment, very pleasant to the smell, which, in a few minutes, removed all the smart of their arrows. These circumstances, added to the refreshment I had received by their victuals and drink, which were very nourishing, disposed me to sleep. I slept about eight hours, as I was afterwards assured, and it was no wonder, for the physicians, by the emperor's order, had mingled a sleepy potion in the hogsheads of wine. It seems that upon the first moment I was discovered sleeping on the ground, after my landing, the emperor had early notice of it by an express, and determined in council that I should be tied in the manner I have related, which was done in the night while I slept. The plenty of meat and drink should be sent to me, and a machine prepared to carry me to the capital city. This resolution perhaps may appear very bold and dangerous, and I am confident would not be imitated by any prince in Europe on the like occasion. 
However, in my opinion, it was extremely prudent, as well as generous. For, supposing these people had endeavored to kill me with their spears and arrows while I was asleep, I should certainly have awakened with the first sense of smart, which might so far have roused my rage and strength as to have enabled me to break the strings wherewith I was tied. After which, as they were not able to make resistance, so they could expect no mercy. These people are most excellent mathematicians, and arrived to a great perfection in mechanics, by the countenance and encouragement of the emperor, who is a renowned patron of learning. This prince has several machines fixed on wheels, for the carriage of trees and other great weights. He often builds his largest men of war, whereof some are nine feet long, in the woods where the timber grows, and has them carried on these engines three or four hundred yards to the sea. Five hundred carpenters and engineers were immediately set at work to prepare the greatest engine they had. It was a frame of wood raised three inches from the ground, about seven feet long and four wide, moving upon twenty-two wheels. The shout I heard was upon the arrival of this engine, which it seems set out in four hours after my landing. It was brought parallel to me as I lay. But the principal difficulty was to raise and place me in this vehicle. Eighty poles, each of one foot high, were erected for this purpose, and very strong cords of the bigness of pack threads were fastened by hooks to many bandages, which the workmen had girt round my neck, my hands, my body, and my legs. Nine hundred of the strongest men were employed to draw up these cords, by many pulleys fastened on the poles, and thus, in less than three hours, I was raised and slung into the engine, and there tied fast. All this I was told, for while the operation was performing, I lay in a profound sleep, by the force of that soporiferous medicine infused into my liquor. Fifteen hundred of the emperor's largest horses, each about four inches and a half high, were employed to draw me towards the metropolis, which, as I said, was half a mile distant. About four hours after we began our journey, I awakened by a very ridiculous accident. For the carriage being stopped a while, to adjust something that was out of order, two or three of the young natives had the curiosity to see how I looked when I was asleep. They climbed up into the engine, and advancing very softly to my face, one of them, an officer in the guards, put the sharp end of his half-pike a good way up into my left nostril which tickled my nose like a straw and made me sneeze violently, whereon they stole off unperceived, and it was three weeks before I knew the cause of my waking so suddenly. We made a long march the remaining part of the day and rested at night with five hundred guards on each side of me, half with torches and half with bows and arrows, ready to shoot me if I should offer to stir. The next morning at sunrise we continued our march, and arrived within two hundred yards of the city gates about noon. The emperor and all his court came out to meet us. But his great officers would by no means suffer his majesty to endanger his person by mounting on my body. At the place where the carriage stopped, there stood an ancient temple, esteemed to be the largest in the whole kingdom, which, having been polluted some years before by an unnatural murder, was, according to the zeal of those people, looked upon as profane and therefore had been applied to common use, and all the ornaments and furniture carried away. In this edifice it was determined I should lodge. The great gate fronting to the north was about four feet high, and almost two feet wide, through which I could easily creep. On each side of the gate was a small window, not above six inches from the ground. Into that, on the left side, the king's smith conveyed fourscore and eleven chains like those that hang to a lady's watch in Europe, and almost as large, which were locked to my left leg with six and thirty padlocks. Over against this temple, on the other side of the great highway, at twenty feet distance, there was a turret at least five feet high. Here the emperor ascended, with many principled lords of his court, to have an opportunity of viewing me, as I was told, for I could not see them. It was reckoned, that above a hundred thousand inhabitants came out of the town upon the same errand, and in spite of my guards, I believe there could not be fewer than ten thousand at several times, 
who mounted my body by the help of ladders. But a proclamation was soon issued, to forbid it upon pain of death. When the workmen found it was impossible for me to break loose, they cut all the strings that bound me, whereupon I rose up with as melancholy a disposition as ever I had in my life. But the noise and astonishment of the people at seeing me rise and walk are not to be expressed. The chains that held my left leg were about two yards long and gave me not only the liberty of walking backwards and forwards in a semicircle, but, being fixed within four inches of the gate, allowed me to creep in and lie at my full length in the temple. Chapter 2 The Emperor of Lilliput, attended by several of the nobility, comes to see the author in his confinement. The Emperor's person and habit described. Learned men appoint to teach the author their language. He gains favor by his mild disposition. His pockets are searched, and his sword and pistols taken from him. When I found myself on my feet, I looked about me, and must confess I never beheld a more entertaining prospect. The country around appeared like a continued garden, and the enclosed fields, which were generally forty feet square, resembled so many beds of flowers. These fields were intermingled with woods of half a stang, and the tallest trees, as I could judge, appeared to be seven feet high. I viewed the town on my left hand, which looked like the painted scene of a city in a theater. I had been for some hours extremely pressed by the necessities of nature, which was no wonder, it being almost two days since I had last disburdened myself. I was under great difficulties between urgency and shame. The best expedient I could think of was to creep into my house, which I accordingly did, and shutting the gate after me, I went as far as the length of my chain would suffer and discharged my body of that uneasy load. But this was the only time I was ever guilty of so uncleanly an action, for which I cannot but hope the candid reader will give some allowance, after he has maturely and impartially considered my case and the distress I was in. From this time, my constant practice was, as soon as I rose, to perform that business in open air, at the full extent of my chain, and due care was taken every morning before company came, that the offensive matter should be carried off in wheelbarrows by two servants appointed for that purpose. I would not have dwelt so long upon a circumstance that perhaps at first sight may appear not very momentous, if I had not thought it necessary to justify my character, in point of cleanliness, to the world, which I am told some of my maligners have been pleased upon this and other occasions to call in question. When this adventure was at an end, I came back out of my house, having occasion for fresh air. The emperor was already descended from the tower, and advancing on horseback towards me, which had like to have cost him dear, for the beast, although very well trained, yet wholly unused to such a sight, which appeared as if a mountain moved before him, reared up on its hinder feet. But that prince, who was an excellent horseman, kept his seat, till his attendants ran in and held the bridle, while his majesty had time to dismount. When he alighted, he surveyed me round with great admiration, but kept beyond the length of my chain. He ordered his cooks and butlers, who were already prepared, to give me victuals and drink, which they pushed forward in a sort of vehicles upon wheels, till I could reach them. I took these vehicles and soon emptied them all. Twenty of them were filled with meat, and ten with liquor. Each of the former afforded me two or three good mouthfuls, and I emptied the liquor of ten vessels, which was contained in earthen vials, into one vehicle, drinking it off at a draught. And so I did with the rest. The empress, and young princes of the blood of both sexes, attended by many ladies, sat at some distance in their chairs. But upon the accident that happened to the emperor's horse, they alighted and came near his person, which I am now going to describe. He is taller by almost the breadth of my nail than any of his court, which alone is enough to strike an awe into the beholders. His features are strong and masculine, with an Austrian lip and arched nose, his complexion olive, his countenance erect, his body and limbs well-proportioned, 
all his motions graceful, and his deportment majestic. He was then past his prime, being twenty-eight years and three-quarters old, of which he had reigned about seven in great felicity, and generally victorious. For the better convenience of beholding him, I lay on my side, so that my face was parallel to his, and he stood but three yards off. However, I have had him since many times in my hand, and therefore cannot be deceived in the description. His dress was very plain and simple, and the fashion of it between the Asiatic and the European. But he had on his head a light helmet of gold adorned with jewels, and a plume on the crest. He held his sword drawn in his hand to defend himself, if I should happen to break loose. It was almost three inches long. The hilt and scabbard were gold enriched with diamonds. His voice was shrill, but very clear and articulate, and I could distinctly hear it when I stood up. The ladies and courtiers were all most magnificently clad, so that the spot they stood upon seemed to resemble a petticoat spread upon the ground, embroidered with figures of gold and silver. His imperial majesty spoke often to me, and I returned answers, but neither of us could understand a syllable. There were several of his priests and lawyers present, as I conjectured by their habits, who were commanded to address themselves to me, and I spoke to them in as many languages as I had the least smattering of, which were High and Low Dutch, Latin, French, Spanish, Italian, and Lingua Franca, but all to no purpose. After about two hours the court retired, and I was left with a strong guard to prevent the impertinence and probably the malice of the rabble, who were very impatient to crowd about me as near as they durst, and some of them had the impudence to shoot their arrows at me as I sat on the ground by the door of my house, whereof one very narrowly missed my left eye. But the colonel ordered six of the ringleaders to be seized, and thought no punishment so proper as to deliver them bound into my hands, which some of his soldiers accordingly did, pushing them forward with the butt-ends of their pikes into my reach. I took them all in my right hand, put five of them into my coat pocket, and as to the sixth, I made a countenance as if I would eat him alive. The poor man squalled terribly, and the colonel and his officers were in much pain, especially when they saw me take out my penknife. But I soon put them out of fear, for looking mildly and immediately cutting the strings he was bound with, I sat him gently on the ground, and away he ran. I treated the rest in the same manner, taking them one by one out of my pocket, and I observed both the soldiers and people were highly delighted at this mark of my clemency, which was represented very much to my advantage in court. Towards night, I got with some difficulty into my house, where I lay on the ground, and continued to do so about a fortnight, during which time the emperor gave orders to have a bed prepared for me. Six hundred beds of the common measure were brought in carriages, and worked up in my house, a hundred and fifty of their beds, sewn together, made up the breadth and length, and these were four double, which, however, kept me but very indifferently from the hardness of the floor, that was of smooth stone. By the same computation, they provided me with sheets, blankets, and coverlets, tolerable enough for one who had been so long inured to hardships. As the news of my arrival spread through the kingdom, it brought prodigious numbers of rich, idle, and curious people to see me, so that the villages were almost emptied, and great neglect of tillage and household affairs must have ensued, if his imperial majesty had not provided, by several proclamations and orders of state, against this inconveniency. He directed that those who had already beheld me should return home, and not presume to come within fifty yards of my house, without license from the court, whereby the secretaries of state got considerable fees. In the meantime, the emperor held frequent councils to debate what course should be taken with me, and I was afterwards assured by a particular friend, a person of great quality, who was as much in the secret as any, that the court was under many difficulties concerning me. They apprehended my breaking loose, that my diet would be very expensive and might cause a famine. Sometimes they determined to starve me, or at least to shoot me in the face and hands with poisoned arrows, which would soon dispatch me. 
but again they considered that the stench of so large a carcass might produce a plague in the metropolis and probably spread through the whole kingdom. In the midst of these consultations, several officers of the army went to the door of the great council chamber, and two of them being admitted, gave an account of my behavior to the six criminals above mentioned, which made so favorable impression in the breast of his majesty and the whole board in my behalf, that an imperial commission was issued out, obliging all the villages, nine hundred yards round the city, to deliver in every morning six beeves, forty sheep, and other victuals for my sustenance, together with a proportionable quantity of bread and wine and other liquors, for the due payment of which His Majesty gave assignments upon his treasury. For this prince lives chiefly upon his own domains, seldom, except upon great occasions, raising any subsidies upon his subjects, who are bound to attend him in his wars at their own expense. An establishment was also made of six hundred persons to be my domestics, who had board wages allowed for their maintenance, and tents built for them very conveniently on each side of my door. It was likewise ordered that three hundred tailors should make me a suit of clothes, after the fashion of the country, that six of His Majesty's greatest scholars should be employed to instruct me in their language, and lastly, that the emperor's horses, and those of the nobility, and troops of guards, should be frequently exercised in my sight, to accustom themselves to me. All these orders were duly put in execution, and in about three weeks I made a great progress in learning their language, during which time the emperor frequently honored me with his visits, and was pleased to assist my masters in teaching me. We began already to converse together in some sort, and the first words I learned were to express my desire that he would please give me my liberty, which I every day repeated on my knees. His answer, as I could comprehend it, was that this must be a work of time, not to be thought on without the advice of his counsel, and that first I must lumos calmen peso desmar lonem poso, that is, swear a peace with him and his kingdom. However, that I should be used with all kindness, and he advised me to acquire, by my patience and discreet behavior, the good opinion of himself and his subjects. He desired I would not take it ill if he gave orders to certain proper officers to search me, for probably I might carry about me several weapons, which must needs be dangerous things, if they answered the bulk of so prodigious a person. I said, His Majesty should be satisfied, for I was ready to strip myself and turn up my pockets before him. This I delivered part in words and part in signs. He replied that by the laws of the kingdom I must be searched by two of his officers, that he knew this could not be done without my consent and assistance, and he had so good an opinion of my generosity and justice as to trust their persons in my hands, and whatever they took from me should be returned when I left the country, or paid for at the rate which I would set upon them. I took up the two officers in my hands, put them first into my coat pockets, and then into every other pocket about me, except my two fobs, and another secret pocket, which I had no mind should be searched, wherein I had some little necessaries that were of no consequence to any but myself. In one of my fobs there was a silver watch, and in the other a small quantity of gold in a purse. These gentlemen, having pen, ink, and paper about them, made an exact inventory of everything they saw, and when they had done, desired I would set them down, that they might deliver it to the emperor. This inventory I afterwards translated into English, and is, word for word, as follows. In primi, in the right coat pocket of the great man-mountain, for so I interpret the words quinbus flestrin, after the strictest search we found only one great piece of coarse cloth, large enough to be a foot cloth for your majesty's chief room of state. In the left pocket we found a huge silver chest, with a cover of the same metal, which we the searchers were not able to lift. We desired it should be opened, and one of us stepping into it, found himself up to the mid-leg in a sort of dust, some part whereof flying up to our faces, set us both a-sneezing for several times together. In his right waistcoat pocket we found a prodigious bundle of white thin substances, folded one over another, about the bigness of three men, tied with a strong cable and marked with black figures, 
which we humbly conceive to be writings, every letter almost half as large as the palm of our hands. In the left, there was a sort of engine, from the back of which were extended twenty long poles, resembling the palisados before your majesty's court, wherewith we conjecture the man-mountain combs his head. For we did not always trouble him with questions, because we found it a great difficulty to make him understand us. In the large pocket, on the right side of his middle cover, so I translate the word ranfulo, by which they meant my breeches, we saw a hollow pillar of iron, about the length of a man, fastened to a strong piece of timber larger than a pillar, and upon one side of the pillar were huge pieces of iron sticking out, cut into strange figures, which we know not what to make of. In the left pocket, another engine of the same kind. In the smaller pocket on the right side were several round flat pieces of white and red metal, of different bulk. Some of the white, which seemed to be silver, were so large and heavy that my comrade and I could hardly lift them. In the left pocket were two black pillars irregularly shaped. We could not, without difficulty, reach the top of them, as we stood at the bottom of his pocket. One of them was covered, and seemed all of a piece. But at the upper end of the other there appeared a white round substance, about twice the bigness of our heads. Within each of these was enclosed a prodigious plate of steel, which by our orders we obliged him to show us because we apprehended they might be dangerous engines. He took them out of their cases and told us that in his own country his practice was to shave his beard with one of these, and cut his meat with the other. There were two pockets which we could not enter. These he called his fobs. They were two large slits cut into the top of his middle cover, but squeezed close by the pressure of his belly. Out of the right fob hung a great silver chain, with a wonderful kind of engine at the bottom. We directed him to draw out whatever was at the end of that chain, which appeared to be a globe, half silver, and half of some transparent metal. For on the transparent side we saw certain strange figures circularly drawn, and thought we could touch them till we found our figures stopped by the lucid substance. He put this engine into our ears, which made an incessant noise, like that of a water mill, and we conjecture it is either some unknown animal or the god that he worships. But we are more inclined to the latter opinion, because he assured us, if we understood him right, for he expressed himself very imperfectly, that he seldom did anything without consulting it. He called it his oracle, and said it pointed out the time for every action of his life. From the left fob he took out a net almost large enough for a fisherman, but contrived to open and shut like a purse, and served him for the same use. We found therein several massy pieces of yellow metal, which, if they be real gold, must be of immense value. Having thus, in obedience to your majesty's commands, diligently searched all his pockets, we observed a girdle about his waist made of the hide of some prodigious animal, from which, on the left side, hung a sword the length of five men, and on the right, a bag or pouch divided into two cells each cell capable of holding three of your majesty's subjects. In one of these cells were several globes or balls, of a most ponderous metal, about the bigness of our heads, and requiring a strong hand to lift them. The other cell contained a heap of certain black grains, but of no great bulk or weight, for we could hold above fifty of them in the palms of our hands. This is an exact inventory of what we found about the body of the man-mountain who used us with great civility, and due respect to your majesty's commission. Signed and sealed on the fourth day of the eighty-ninth moon of your majesty's auspicious reign, Clefrin Freelock, Marcy Freelock. When this inventory was read over to the emperor, he directed me, although in very gentle terms, to deliver up the several particulars. He first called for my scimitar, which I took out, scabbard and all. In the meantime he ordered three thousand of his choicest troops, who then attended him, to surround me at a distance, with their bows and arrows ready to discharge. But I did not observe it, for my eyes were wholly fixed upon his majesty. He then desired me to draw my scimitar, which, although it had got some rust by the sea-water, was in most parts exceedingly bright. I did so, and immediately all the troops gave a shout between terror and surprise 
for the sun shone clear, and the reflection dazzled their eyes as I waved the scimitar to and fro in my hand. His Majesty, who is a most magnanimous prince, was less daunted than I could expect. He ordered me to return it to the scabbard and cast it on the ground as gently as I could, about six feet from the end of my chain. The next thing he demanded was one of the hollow iron pillars, by which he meant my pocket pistols. I drew it out, and at his desire, as well as I could, expressed to him the use of it, and charging it only with powder, which, by the closeness of my pouch, happened to escape wetting in the sea, an inconvenience against which all prudent mariners take special care to provide, I first cautioned the emperor not to be afraid, and then I let it off in the air. The astonishment here was much greater than at the sight of my scimitar. Hundreds fell down as if they had been struck dead, and even the emperor, although he stood his ground, could not recover himself for some time. I delivered up both my pistols in the same manner as I had done my scimitar, and then my pouch of powder and bullets, begging him that the former might be kept from fire, for it would kindle with the smallest spark, and blow up his imperial palace into the air. I likewise delivered up my watch, which the emperor was very curious to see, and commanded two of his tallest yeomen of the guards to bear it on a pole upon their shoulders, as Draymen in England do a barrel of ale. He was amazed at the continual noise it made, and the motion of the minute hand, which he could easily discern. For their sight is much more acute than ours. He asked the opinions of his learned men about it, which were various and remote, as the reader may well imagine without my repeating, although indeed I could not perfectly understand them. I then gave up my silver and copper money, my purse, with nine large pieces of gold and some smaller ones, my knife and razor, my comb and silver snuff-box, my handkerchief and journal-book. My scimitar, pistols, and pouch were conveyed in carriages to His Majesty's stores, but the rest of my goods were returned to me. I had, as I before observed, one private pocket, which escaped their search, wherein there was a pair of spectacles, which I sometimes use for the weakness of my eyes, a pocket perspective, and some other little conveniences, which, being of no consequence to the Emperor, I did not think myself bound in honor to discover, and I apprehended they might be lost or spoiled if I ventured them out of my possession. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of A Voyage to Lilliput, Part 1 of 3, from Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. If you've enjoyed this episode, please become a supporter by going to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. Thanks for pitching in. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me next time, and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>